Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to this week's Wednesday interlude in which I discuss my reading progress of the books that I've been reading since last Wednesday and in which I turn the spotlight on The Skull of Pimpernel and Baroness Emma Ortsey. <coughs> And if you enjoy these Spotlight On episodes and don't want to miss future episodes, be sure to subscribe and ring the notifications bell. But before that, I read the first 60 pages of The Psychology of Time Travel by Kate Mascarinas. After reading the first chapter for my Try a Chapter tag, I was really looking forward to reading The Psychology of Time Travel by Kate Mascarinas, but this book failed to deliver. The story veered off into discussing Barbara's granddaughter, then it discussed a young female student who discovered a gruesome killing in a museum, then it discussed a lesbian relationship for no discernible reason that I could fathom except perhaps the author thought it was trendy. And all this in the most matter-of-fact prosaic way. I did not engage with any of the characters because they have no depth or differentiating characteristics between them. And the story was told as though it was a psychological textbook on time travelling from a scientific point of view. And the story itself had no compelling narrative drive. It was completely lacking in drama and the interest level was just not there. The time shifts were not handled well. And so the plot, if there was one, was totally confusing. The opening chapter promised so much, but it turned out to be a huge disappointment. Now, let us turn the spotlight on the Skull of Pimpernel and Baroness Emma Ortsey. The Skull of Pimpernel series is set in the period 1792 to 1794 at the height of the terror during the French Revolution of 1789 to 1799. So first, a little background information on the French Revolution. The French Revolution can be deemed to have started with the overthrow of the Bastille on the 14th of July 1789 by the sans-culottes, that is, the common people. The common people wore working trousers, unlike the aristocracy who wore fancy knee breeches, hence the term sans-culottes, without breeches. In May 1789, Louis XVI had convened a general assembly of the Estates General, consisting of the clergy, the nobility and the commoners, for the purpose of sorting out the financial crisis that had arisen in France due to their involvement in the American Revolution and the Seven Years' War, a Europe-wide conflict. The country was in dire financial straits and the repressive burdens of taxation fell on those least able to bear it. Unpopular taxation, bad harvests, deregulation of the grain industry leading to higher bread prices and the environmental problems were some of the issues that inflamed the general population especially when they felt that the clergy and the nobility were enjoying privileges that were denied to them. The third estate, that is the elected commoners, quickly took control of the assembly and they invited members of the clergy and nobility to join them when they formed the National Assembly. In August 1789 they enacted the Declaration of the Rights of Man and the Citizen and outlawed the feudal rights of the nobility. In September 1792 the Republic was declared and in January 1793 Louis XVI was executed. A dictatorship emerged with the institution of the Committee of Public Safety and a policy of control by terror was instigated and championed by Maximilian Robespierre, who rose to prominence in 1793. Anyone not giving allegiance to the revolution was immediately suspect and was de facto guilty of treason against the state and was sent to the guillotine. Those most likely to suffer the death penalty were members of the priv privileged orders, the clergy and the no nobility. 
As Ortsy wrote, every aristocrat was a traitor, as his ancestors had been before him. For 200 years now, the people had sweated and toiled and starved to keep a lustful court in lavish extravagance. Now the descendants of those who had helped to make those courts brilliant had to hide for their lives, to fly if they wished to avoid the tardy vengeance of the people. With this situation as a background, enter Sir Percy Blakeney, alias the Scarlet Pimpernel. Baroness Emma Ortsey originally presented the Scarlet Pimpernel to the world in a very successful stage play which opened in London's West End on the 15th on the 5th of January 1905. It ran for four years in London, broke many stage records, eventually played for more than 2,000 performances and became one of the most popular shows staged in Britain. This theatrical success generated huge sales for the novel. With Sir Percy Blakeney, Brownus Orty introduced the idea of a hero with a secret identity into popular culture. The Scarlet Pimpernel exhibits characteristics that would become standard superhero conventions, including the penchant for disguise, use of a signature weapon, in Blakeney's case a sword, ability to outthink and outwit, outwit his adversaries, and a calling card. He leaves behind a card picturing a Scarlet Pimpernel, a simple English flower, at each of his interventions. Do not expect high-flown literature. The novels are written as melodramas in racy prose. The situations are improbable, the escapes are skin-of-the-teeth adventure. Think of the Scarlet Pimpernel as a superhero with almost superhuman powers that enable him to carry out feats that would be impossible for any ordinary mortal. The stories are enthralling escapist popular fiction, and if approached in that light there is a great deal of enjoyment to be had. Baroness Emma Orty was a Hungarian-born British novelist and playwright, born on the 23rd of September 1865. As you might expect, with her aristocratic family background, title and creation of Sir Percy Blakeney, Orty was a firm believer in the superiority of the aristocracy. Orty went on to write over a dozen sequels featuring Sir Percy Blakeney, his family and the other members of the League of the Scarlet Pimpernel. Here is the opening page of the Scarlet Pimpernel, which lays the foundation for what is to follow and reveals Ortsy's aristocratic prejudices and detestation for the mindless masses. Paris, September 1792. A surging, seething, murmuring crowd of beings that are human only in name, for to the eye and ear they seem naught but savage creatures, animated by vile passions and by the lust of vengeance and of hate. The hour, some little time before sunset, and the place, the West Barricade, at the very spot where, a decade later, a proud tyrant raised an undying monument to the nation's glory and his own vanity. During the greater part of the day, the guillotine had been kept busy at its ghastly work, all that France had boasted of in the past centuries of ancient names and blue blood had paid toll to her desire for liberty and for fraternity. The carnage had only ceased at this late hour of the day because there were other more interesting sights for the people to witness, a little while before the final closing of the barricades for the night. And so the crowd rushed away from the Place de la Greve and made for the various barricades in order to watch this interesting and amusing sight. It was to be, it was to be seen every day, for those aristos were such fools. They were traitors to the people, of course, all of them, men, women and children who, ha who happened to be descendants of the great men who, since the Crusades, had made the glory of France her old noblesse. Their ancestors had oppressed the people, had crushed them under their scarlet heels of their dainty buckled shoes, and now the people had become the rulers of France and crushed their former masters, not beneath their heel, for they were shoeless mostly in those days, but beneath a more effectual weight, the knife of the guillotine. And daily, hourly, the hideous instrument of torture claimed its many victims, old men, young women, tiny children, even until the day when it would finally demand the head of a king, 
and a beautiful young queen. Baroness Emma Orty died in Henley on Thames, Oxfordshire on the 12th of November 1947, aged 82. In this brief introduction I could only hit some of the highlights, but if you'd like to read more of the Scarlet Pimpernel canon and other writings by Baroness Orty, then type the following in Amazon, Baroness Orty Ultimate Collection for the Kindle version. This collection contains 130 of her novels for 99 pence in the UK and $1.30 in the US. I will leave these details in the resources section in the show notes below. Alternatively, you can try to source the omnibus editions of her Scarlet Pimpernel novels, each containing four of the novels such as these. They seek him here, they seek him there. Those book bars seek him everywhere. Is he in bookshop heaven or Amazon hell? The dandy Lucy Pimpernel. I can also recommend the 1982 movie with Anthony Andrews as the Scarlet Pimpernel and Jane Seymour at her loveliest as Marguerite Saint Just, Sir Percy's French wife, which is available on YouTube. I'll put a link to the movie in the show notes below. Let me know in the comments below if after hearing the extracts of the Scarlet Pimpernel you're not tempted to try reading some of Baroness Orty's novels of this character. In this week's Sunday Morning Meetup I will be presenting an original tag, the 10 Booktubers Personalities tag. So be sure to subscribe and ring the notifications bell if you want to hear my take on this tag. So that's all folks, and remember to comment, subscribe, like and share, and I'll be back soon with another BookTube video.